Schaub. I'm the author, events coordinator for St. Louis County Library, and I'm very thrilled to be hosting tonight's virtual author series event with best-selling suspense writer James Rollin. James yeah. Rollins is the New York Times best-selling author of over 30 ad action adventure novels and techno thrillers, including 15 books in the Sigma Force suspense series. And tonight's featured book is a Sigma Force novel. It's called The Last Odyssey. So James Rollins, welcome. Back Thank to you very much. <laughs> what, so a, you, what a strange way of meeting. Yes. So you are a St. Louis native, right? Exactly. Yes. All the way until uh, my graduate school years in vet school. Well, I actually went to the University of Missouri Columbia for my undergraduate and graduate program. Okay. But prior to that, uh, junior high and high school were in St. Louis. So Great. I miss visiting there because in my you know we've been there the last thing what six seven times i think mm -hmm. and each time it allows me to you know visit my old stomping grounds you know I go to the old house i you know we had at that at that time and i go to the high school i went to to see if anything changed i go eat a sandwich over at lion's choice i if i'm there for dinner i'll do you know, rich and charlie's for dinner just uh in my usual places that i uh can visit but not not any longer. Yeah. Well, not this year. No. Next year. Yeah. Hopefully next next year, year we'll get you back. Yes. yes. Um, do you have a favorite childhood memory spot from St. Louis? Um, in our little uh, Glentine neighborhood, there's a little community pool and tennis court and a little pond right there. I remember every winter, if you just coordinate it just right, there's like one path that you can go from like the top of the, of the uh, park grounds there all the way on, and across the lake. But you had to time it just right, you know, otherwise you would lose momentum. So the goal was always trying to get from the top of the park all the way across the lake if you could. Huh. Great deal of fun. Yeah. All right. So I know a lot of our viewers are very familiar with our series, but in case there's anyone out there who is not, um, can you tell us a little bit about the series? Who is Sigma Force and what do they do? Well, Sigma Force is a, um, they're a team. They're former Special Forces soldiers that were drummed out of the service for various reasons, but because of special aptitude or skill or talents, they were secretly recruited by DARPA, the Defense Department's Research and Development Agency. They're retrained in various scientific disciplines, become uh, field agents for DARPA. And uh, so they go and protect the, you know, the globe, the US against various type of emerging threats. Uh, as I've jokingly referred to them, they're basically the scientists with guns, for lack of a better term. All right. Um, so there's 15 books in the series. Do people need to start at the beginning and work through the series or can they start with this new one or just anywhere in the series? Oh, no, I think very few people besides myself have read the books in order. Um, yeah. I always I enjoy series, but I, I always resent when I'm like on the fifth book of a series and I can't remember what happened in book one, two, three, and four. So I engineered my novel so that no matter when you were hopping in, any backstory you needed, I was going to, I was going to seed into the story so that uh, you're not going to feel lost. Now, yes, of course, you read this, the series in, in order. There's a nuance of character arc that you'll appreciate, but definitely not necessary. I think most people have found me airport bookstore or somewhere along the lines. They pull me off a shelf and hopefully the cover copy interests them. They read the book and they like it. Hopefully they'll go back and fill in the blanks. But uh, definitely, if you want to join in, you can just hop in right with, with The Last Odyssey and not feel lost. Great. So these books, I know they combine um, a lot of scientific exploration and historical research and then adventure too. Um, and this new book, The Last Odyssey, takes a lot from Homer's classic, The Odyssey. Um, right. Why did you choose that book? And where did you go with that story in your own? Well, you know, a lot of my books in the past and this, this newest uh, included is I'm always looking for those hidden truths, you know, that are you know, buried or, or secreted away. But oftentimes those truths are revealed through story, through mythology. I always think there's maybe a, you know, a, some hidden truth, some seed of, uh, of knowledge in those ancient stories. So, you know, I've dabbled with that in various books in the past. And you know, one of the biggest epics of mythology is Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. And that was always in my little idea folder. I knew eventually I would, you know, try to look more deeply into that, into that, into those stories. But I didn't know my, I didn't know the, how to, what the entry point was going to be. And then again, I've always got my antenna up for some cool bit of science or a bit of history. And I found out 
from reading the article in, I believe it was New Science Magazine. There was a, uh, a British management consultant. So not an archeologist, just a, a guy that had an interest in all things mytho mythological. And he was studying clues in Homer's Iliad and matching them to, to new geological tools out there like Google Earth or Google Maps and began to piece together where he believed uh, Odysseus, the hero of the Odyssey, his hometown was the, was the, the town of Ithaca. But there actually is a real place called the Ithaca in Greece, but it doesn't match the description in the, in the book. So everybody thought Ithaca was just a made up place that somebody named that town, the current town after the Odyssey wasn't the true location. And so, you know, he presented a paper laying out his, 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 his proposition of why he believed this place was on the uh, peninsula of Palika in Greece was the hometown of Ithaca. And then archeologists went and they studied his data and they said, yeah, we believe you're right. That actually matches it to a T. So all of a sudden, you know, this mythic place of Ithaca had a real, real uh, location. Now I had known the same was true for Troy. Now for the longest period of time, everybody thought Troy was a mythic place, a made up place. And for the longest period of time, everybody thought it was just fictional. Until in the late 19th century, again, another armchair archeologist, uh, a gentleman named Heinrich Schliemann uh, was excavating along the Turkish coast, uh, exposed some ruins that he believed was Troy. Again, it took a little, it took a few decades, but eventually archaeologists concurred. Yes, that was Troy. So within a matter of you know moment, all of a sudden mythology became history. So here we had now, you know, in the past we already knew Troy was a real location, and just recently now we found Ithaca is a real location. So the, the, the gist of the Odyssey is Odysseus voyaging from the end of the Trojan War in Troy and trying to get home to Ithaca. So now the starting place and the end place of the Odyssey seem to be uh, real locations. So then I got thinking as a thriller writer, well, how many other spots in between that starting place and the end spot might also be true? And so I began doing research and, and began sort of snowballing this ability to tell a story based on the, the truth hidden behind the mythology of Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. Hmm. Great. So your research also took you to Iceland too, correct? Correct. Because I, I knew the story needed a starting, my story needed a starting point. And the, the gist of this novel is that there is a um, centuries old medieval ship that's found buried two miles, I'm sorry, half a mile under the ice of, Antar of uh, Greenland. Because of the melt that's occurring in Greenland, it gets exposed. Uh, some researchers go in to examine the, the ship. And in the ship's hold, they discover this sort of clockwork gold map that's ticking along that seems to be pointing towards the location of the mythic land of Tartarus, which is the Greek version of hell, which is also featured in Homer's Odyssey. At one point, Odysseus goes to the gates of Tartarus, the gates of hell. So then I, you know, my goal then was to try to find that gates of hell. So I'm trying to think of where that might be located. Well, I did a trip to Iceland, which also was experiencing uh, a major um, melting and, and loss of glaciers. And when I was there was a time they were actually bookmarking and commemorating uh, the uh, a glacier that completely evaporated, completely disappeared and melted away. So knowing I was always thinking about this melting of Greenland, that became sort of the crux of, of where I wanted to start the story. And I had, vis I had visited um, a hot spring called the Blue Lagoon. And it's sort of a, sort of a cool place to start the story. So I, I dumped two of my major characters right there in that hot spring and begin the story there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the book also talks about some apocalyptic cults. And you did it some does. research into that. What did you learn about those groups? Well, it goes back to the same interest I have in mythology and religion and, and storytelling as a way of understanding the world. And being that this was going to be a sort of a, an apocalyptic story, I thought, well, what are the common views of the end of the world? How many, you know, what different cultures over the years, how have they envisioned how the world was going to end? And I found out that there was a lot of commonality, especially in, in the Western religions between Judaism, Christianity, and, and Islam, that they share a very, a lot of crossover between what they believe the end of the world is going to look like. And so I, I began to look a little bit deeper and I discovered that, you know, not only that there's a certain groups that are, are looking to um, use those clues in the Bible or in uh, the Torah 
uh, for clues on, on how the world's going to end and, and possibly that we're in the end times right now. And not only that, are we in the end times, that maybe we should um, help those end times along and try to, try to reach those end times, which is disturbing. You know, I'm, I'm not in any hurry to see the end of the world, especially considering what's going on right now. And I discovered that uh, even in, in Islam, the, uh, the current president and the supreme leader of, of Islam are also what are uh, the 12, they're believers of the Twelvers. They believe the 12th Imam is due to arrive on earth, which would herald the end of the world. So even they believe that we're in the beginning of the end times. Uh, so it's, a, it's a disturbing and, and interesting. So this book sort of sheds a little bit of light on the origin, where they might be headed, uh, and the dangers of, of looking and trying to drive towards an apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah, especially relevant right now with the way we're all feeling, I'm sure. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah. I, at this point, you know, we have, uh, you, know, you know, plague of locusts across Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got uh, uh, this current plague. So it just makes you wonder, oh, maybe, maybe we are in those end times. Yeah. Hopefully not. So the book, um, there's also this idea in it of World War Zero, which I had never heard about before, but there's some historical truth to that, right? Or some fact okay, that you I mean, in. there is definitely a, a real event. Um, again, me being a thriller writer, I'm always looking for those, those historical mysteries, those pieces mm -hmm. of history that end in a question mark, something mm -hmm. I can solve within the pages of a novel. And so uh, in researching this novel and researching the, the story behind uh, the Homer's Illa and the Odyssey. Those stories take place during uh, a time called the Greek Dark Ages. Sometimes that period is called the Homeric Age because the only account of that, of basically three centuries, is Homer's Illa and the Odyssey. Very little is written. Most, most things were destroyed during that period of time. So there's a little, very little written record of it. And why, that, why there's such a little uh, record is that there was a major war that occurred across the breadth of the Mediterranean. Uh, during that war, uh, some unknown civilization, some unknown force, enemy, arrived in the Mediterranean and wiped out uh, three major civilizations that were, were thriving very strongly. They knocked out the, the Mycenaean Greeks, it knocked out the Anatolian Hittites, and it knocked out the Egyptians. They were brought basically to their knees, and because they were brought so low, uh, that's what created that dark space, that dark spot in history, is that uh, you know, all the ability to, to, to maintain and, and write and record uh, disappeared. Right. But what is not known and why that world, that, that great cataclysm, that great battle was called World War Zero, is that at, at that point, you know, the known world was the breadth of the Mediterranean. So uh, a war that was occurring across the breadth of the Mediterranean was a world war. So some historians began dubbing it World War Zero, the first sort of real world war, a war of the, of the known world. But what is not known, what remains a mystery, that that question mark in history is what, who were the enemy. What was the enemy? Where did they come from? Who were they? Uh, there's different theories, and that's explored in the last Odyssey, is what, uh, what that force might have been, where they came from, where they might have gone. Because after they, they came in, vanquished those three mighty civilizations, they vanished again. So as a mystery writer, I'm thinking, or a thriller writer, I'm thinking that's you know, great fodder to explore in a novel. So you're going to find some, uh, some of uh, the actual history about that period of time in the last Odyssey, and also a bit of uh, my imagining of you know, what filling in some of those blanks using my own imagination. Yeah, great. Um, so from your publicist, I've been cued in that your next book is called The Savage Zone, and it actually deals with viruses. Exactly, talking about bad timing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so is there and anything you can share kind of in light of our current situation about that book or your thoughts on? A couple of things. Um, again, I remember when I was, again, Savage Zone is almost all done. I'm trying to put that one to bed. So uh, when I was, this was all occurring, I think, oh, how unfortunate, you know, I, it's too bad this book's not coming out now. Mm -hmm. It's all about viruses. But I thought, no, probably people don't want to read about, uh, you know, horrible viruses while this is going on. You know, my book is, I hope to be a bit of an escape. It's a big armchair adventure. If you can't make it to Europe anymore, you know, you, this is a little way of having a little armchair vacation. But uh, The Savage Zone is not, a, it's not a pandemic novel. I mean, there's some implications, of course, it could become a pandemic, but it's not a pandemic novel per se. Uh, but it, in some ways, it's even scarier than a pandemic because I did a lot of research, talked to a lot of different virologists and, and scientists about the, uh, the strange biology and evolution of, of viruses. And that book's going to uh, 
it's going to be very, very, very creepy. And I'll give you just one scientific tidbit out of that that I discovered is that it, and at all points, uh, we are continually being rained down by viruses. Viruses actually are, are just cast into the air and spread around the world and they, they, they're continually raining down. For every square yard of the earth, over the course of one day, 800 million viruses will land on that spot. Wow. Just to give you some of the idea of the ubiquitousness of, of viruses. So, uh, but again, I don't wanna tell you too much more than that because there's more to come. Yeah, and it's very scary too. <laughs> um, so a lot of your books have to do with sort of um, technological advancements, both and how they affect us both good and right. bad. Um, so what, I mean, can you give me kind of a sense of where you think we're going in the right direction and what kind of scientific advancements that we have going on might particularly frighten you at this time? Well, I, I definitely, that is my, my bread and butter. You know, that's mm -hmm. what I love to explore is besides that historical mystery, those pieces of history and the question mark, the other thing I'm always looking at when I build a novel is that bit of science that makes you go, what if, where's that headed? How is that going to challenge us? So I'm always looking for those, those threats. I and mean, I did a novel just recently, uh, actually not, not recently, maybe four years ago, that dealt with a viral pandemic. It dealt with the fact that things can come loose, get loose out of these labs. And now I was just reading today that the intelligence services are investigating whether the, uh, the COVID-19 actually was uh, possibly uh, escaped out of a, a lab in Wuhan that maybe it wasn't the wet markets uh, in that city because the wet markets in that city are right next door to that same lab. So there's some controversy whether the, uh, that virus would have escaped. So I always like looking for those scientific exploration that would become threats. Now, obviously it's fun to build, I can build a big roller coaster of an adventure using the tools of science. You know, I can make, you know, these, these sudden drops and turns and twists to, to, to get the reader's heart pounding. <clears throat> but me as a writer, the more exciting thing is to, to look at how that's going to affect us, uh, how that challenges us, not just from a, uh, a physical standpoint, but also a moral standpoint. You know, how is that going to change our outlook on, on, on the way we're gonna look forward? I mean, how, let's look at what's going on right now. How is this gonna fundamentally change everything after this event? And we, I believe we will survive it just fine. I believe there will be a vaccine that will be developed. I believe there will be uh, antivirals that will be effective. This will be a thing of the past, but it's imprinted on us. I don't think we'll ever get back to the same thing we were before uh, February. I think the whole world's changed. And that's the thing that I love to explore is, is not just the threat like we're experiencing right now of something of, of scientific origin, but where are we left after that? Right. Right. I hear that we are done shaking hands forever. Yes. Possibly, possibly. <laughs> when Dr. Fauci says, you know, that we should not be, we should never be shaking hands from here right. on out, which right. is, I don't know. That's, that's all something. we give up, then that's great. I'm fine with that. <laughs> so we were talking um, before we got started about your career as a veterinarian. You were a vet for many years before becoming a internationally bestselling suspense writer. So, and you often work unique animals into your books. So is there a unique animal in The Lost Odyssey and what's been your favorite kind of animal to play with and work into your stories? Well, I think it's poorly kept secret. There's a lot of dogs in my books. <laughs> Not that I'm a dog person. I love cats just as much, uh, uh, but uh, you know, they always hold a special place in my heart. I've done a whole series based on a military war dog where I wrote scenes from the dog's point of view. I use my background in behavioral sciences and talking to a lot of the handlers of those dogs. For The Last Odyssey, there is a, a, an appearance of a, a sign language speaking monkey, I mean, sorry, sign, sign language speaking gorilla, but also a, uh, an endangered uh, uh, monkey that's also featured in the book. So there's always, there's always gonna be animals in my book in one way or the other. Yeah, and each book has a doodle that goes with it too, right? You do a it little, does. Yeah. You know, when I ever sign a book, I always add a little, little uh, you know, doodle to it. Even the books that I sign for, um, Left Banks uh, has the doodle in it. And this doodle for this book is um, a little compass rose that I write in, uh, that I doodle into the book besides my signature. Uh, I started doing that a long time ago when I, when I didn't have anybody, I'll show you why that started. Can I write a book in here? Yeah. This is why it started. You know, one of my, the greatest influences uh, of my career, and it's probably a, a poorly kept secret, is, is you know, Clive Cussler. <laughs> this is, you know, Raise the Titanic by Clive Cussler. Yeah. We lost Clive this year, which is a tragedy. Um, I was heartbroken to hear that. Uh, I grew up reading Clive. Clive gave me the first blurb on one of my books. 
Uh, he was besides, so besides being a great writer, he was just a great gentleman. He helped a lot of young authors get get their foot footing in the in the thriller genre, and uh, was always willing to help. But if I flip to where Clive has signed this, I don't know if anybody can see that. Is there's a little doodle mm -hmm. above Clive's signature. So I was very conscious of that when I was beginning my signature. I, you know, I've I remember when I was trying to prepare for my first signing. Um, I didn't know how to do a signing. You know, I attended various signings, obviously, but I never actually paid that much attention to the, the nuts and bolts of how you do a, a, an event. And so I began you know, scrambling together different, you know, different things I learned from different authors and when they did their talks. And so my first book, Subterranean, came out. Didn't have very many people in the audience. Uh, so to keep them in the signing, long, signing line a little longer and to keep them talking, uh, I decided, well, I'm going to do what Clyde did. I'm going to put a little doodle in. And it was quite, a, a, quite an evolved doodle. It's a, it's, a, it's a stick figure of a guy swinging on a rope, holding a flashlight in a cave. So it, 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 even today, it takes me a long time to, to actually to do that doodle. Now, the next year came along and people were like, well, you, you know, you had a doodle in my last book. Why aren't you putting a doodle in this book? And I thought, oh, great. Now I've got to do that every single time. So I, I mix it up, but now I try to do it that I've got to be able to, A, figure out what the doodle is for each book. And then I've got to be able to, to do that doodle so I don't keep people in line for too long, in under 10 seconds. So it takes me probably as long to write the book as to figure out what doodle I'm going to put in that book and, and you know, practice it enough that I can do it fast. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I doodle. No, people love it. I mean, it definitely authenticates your books as your books. I know when I see the signing line, everybody's excited to see what the doodle is going to be. So. Um, but speaking of events, we recently hosted Steve Barry, suspense writer Steve Barry at the library, yeah. and he let us know that you are a character in his new book. Are you aware of this? I am very aware of that. Yes. <laughs> I'm the president of Poland, apparently, using yeah. my real last name, Tchaikovsky. So yeah. yeah. So, it's weird reading that book because, you, know, you know, every time I'm flipping a page, you know, there's my name, there's my name, there's my name. So it's very distracting <laughs> reading it. Yeah. Well, I guess it's the... Um, that idea I've noticed um, with suspense writers, especially um, in the mystery community, there's a really close supportive bond between both the writers and friends like you and Steve, but also the readers and the writers. Um, you know, if we were here in the library tonight, we'd have a whole crowd. I'm sure many people there would have read all your books, probably know the characters better than you do. Probably. Um, people with huge stacks for you to sign with all the doodles. So how is it, Felt to have a really long successful career in that kind of community and do you have any reflections on that 40 30 books when I, I first started writing I did not think this was going to be a career change for me you know, I love being a vet I still love being a vet uh, I love animals love medicine love science I like the times I get to go in once a month and do a spay neuter clinic but uh, my goal when I was writing was just I just wanted to walk into a bookstore and see my book on a shelf that was my only goal, was to walk someday into a bookstore and see one book. Well, this is my 34th book in total. So now I walk into a, you know, a, a bookstore and you know, I've got the shelf now. So that is, it's weird. It's hard to believe that I've, that, that I've written, A, that I've written that many books and B, that I'm here at this point in my career. Um, and when I first started, I had a website and that was weird and unique and no author had websites before. I was cutting edge because this was before social media, before we had any real outlet like, like that. A few authors are doing blogs and things like that, but it was, it was relatively new. And even then, while readers could email you, it, it, and certainly weren't mailing you very many letters anymore, like, like in the past. I remember I was speaking to um, David Morell, who wrote uh, First Blood that became the Rambo movie. Mm -hmm. I asked him, oh, David, in the olden times, when you first started publishing, what was it like? He said, oh, well, we would do nothing. You, we would be lucky. We would do maybe like a little launch party at the bookstore, and that was it. Then you go back and write. And so nowadays, you know, with social media, it's, it's you have to be, you know, it's a lot of the, the promotions are, are, are put on our shoulders, and we have to go out there and, and, uh, massage social media and be active and, and uh, it's very time consuming. Um, but at the same time, it's, we've never had that relationship that we had in the past with readers. Now in my Facebook time, I'll, I'll, I'll put like, these are my three ideas for the title of my next book. I can't decide, you do, you decide. And I'll put it out there. 
uh, I'll say, you know, hey, you know, at the end of this book, Gray is with some unknown woman. Is it Gray or is it Seishan? Let me know. And so a lot of times it's, you know, I love getting that feedback, bouncing things off so I can get a better idea of what those, that readership is interested in, uh, what seems to be catching on with them. Well, we never had that immediate immediacy before. So it's, it's, even though there's a lot of work involved in social media, it's, it's very satisfying that you get to maintain that relationship much more intimate with your readership than you ever had in the past. What are you reading? And do you have any recommendations for great quarantine reads to see us through? You know, I've got a pile of books over here that I did another talk about uh, uh, books that I did a talk about books that influenced me, books that I always recommend. Uh, cause that's why I had, you know, Clyde's book here. Um, there's one author I always recommended every signing. He owes me royalty. I'm just waiting for him to give me his part of his royalty check. Since the beginning of my career, I've been recommending this author. The author's name is Dan Simmons. Um, he's got a little more notoriety because he was the author who wrote um, The Terror that became an AMC series. But uh, prior to that, uh, uh, He's an amazing author and he writes a similar, again, I'm a little envious because he writes across a bunch of different genres. You know, he writes, uh, you know, a mystery, he wins the Edgar Award. He writes a science fiction novel, he wins the Hugo Award. Uh, this novel right here, Song of Cali by Dan Simmons. Um, he just won the uh, Horror Writers Award when this book came out that year. It is probably one of the most horrific novels you'll ever read. I'm not sure you want to read it right now, uh, <laughs> but do at some point, you know, jot it down. Uh, great writer, uh, always envious of, of him. Um, what else do I have here? Again, another book. Just to give you that again, I, uh, growing up, I, I was, I read a wide gamut of different genres. So, you know, I loved fantasy and science fiction, but I loved horror, I loved mysteries. Give me a good spy thriller like Daniel Silva. Interview with the Vampire for the Horror, Stephen King, The Shining. I also love novels that take you to a different place of history, a different location. So this was another one that's a Joe Gunn, Jim Clavell. So what I'm reading right now is the second book in a fantasy series. It's called The Wise Man's Fear. Um, that's what I'm doing right now. Yeah, sounds good. Well, I hope that we can get you back in person next year for another library event. I think you've been there every year for the past five or six. So yeah, it might I'm, be I top hope of our lineup. You know, barring any new viral outbreaks or mutation of this virus or any other world catastrophe that will be out there. Good. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this. Thank you.